Uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on which time zone you're at. Uh, thank you for joining us for this fourth week of the QMC PAC workshop. Uh, my name is Anwar Ben Ali. I'm a scientist at Argonne National Lab, uh, and I will be talking to you today about molecular calculations using Quantum Monte Carlo and the QMC PAC code. Um, so before we start, uh, important notes, just as a reminder, I am not going to go through the theory of variation or, or diffusion Monte Carlo as uh, this has been given in the past lecture on week two. I invite you to look again at the slides if you need to uh, at this address of the, um, the address of the workshop or on our YouTube channel on QMC PAC. Uh, also, I will be using uh, extensively statistics and the Nexus work frame. So uh, this has been also presented on week three of the workshop. So I would encourage you to look again, either to the YouTube channel and to um, the notes and the talk from uh, week three from last week. And finally, uh, if you want to have more details about either the theory or the method, uh, or the code, sorry, um, I invite you to look at the manual of QMC back uh, and the addresses here. So during this uh, lecture, I will try to go through a, a QMC or quantum Monte Carlo workflow applied that we're gonna start by uh, seeing how we can generate a trial wave function, uh, just the determinant part of the wave function then we're gonna build this trial wave function by adding to this determinant part, the JASTRO function. So I'm gonna try to show you how we add JASTROs, what are the JASTROs and how we optimize them. Then how we can optimize the trial wave function in general, but in this specific case, we're gonna focus on how to optimize a single determinant trial wave function. So we're gonna optimize JASTRO parameters. And finally, variation of Monte Carlo and it's which means which parameters we need to select, such as time steps or uh, populations and how to reduce error bars. So again, a very, very quick recap about the main approximation that is part of the fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo. And this basically comes from uh, the fact that in quantum Monte Carlo, or at least in diffusion Monte Carlo, it is a projector method. And uh, it is based on the time dependent evolution of the wave function. So basically in the imaginary Schrodinger time. So basically any state orthogonal to the ground state will decay exponentially fast to the ground state. So as time or as this imaginary time goes, goes on, we're going to decay very, very fast to this, um, to this uh, uh, ground state, and we're going to eliminate any type of noise from the excited states. So if we were to do this, this would be equivalent to trying to force all the electrons to collapse to the ground state, which of course would be against the anti-symmetry principle uh, and of exchanging two particles. This works very well for the bosonic solutions, but electrons, anytime you switch, Two electron spaces, you technically should switch the sign of the wave function. So basically, that's exactly how we're going to enforce the anti-symmetry part of the wave function, which means that we are not going to allow two electrons when when we move an electron or when we generate a new solution to the Schrodinger equation. Um, if that new solution changes the sign of the wave function, the move is rejected. So this is the fixed node approximation. Again. Um, uh, if we were to leave them do whatever they want, all the electrons will collapse in the same state, and that's the bosonic solution. But what we do is we force them to stay in those states. So if the position where the nodal surface changes or where the wave function changes, if this point here was exact, this means that the, no the wave function is exact, the nodal surface is exact, and our QMC will be exact because the diffusion Monte Carlo is variational. So it is upper bound to the exact nodal surface, which means if we introduce a nodal surface, if the nodal surface is exact, we will be exact. Any deviation from the exact solution or the exact position of the node will just make your energy higher. And this is very important. And this is why I'm repeating it a lot. It's because throughout the calculation that we are going to do, any nodal surface or any starting point that we choose that will lower the energy will be better and will make our variance lower. And we're going to see this throughout uh, the talk. So again, for the choice of this trial wave function, as I said, we pick a guiding function, a trial wave function. And this determinant part here can be generated through any type of uh, single particle orbital. 
In molecular cases, it is often the case that we choose uh, a linear combination of atomic orbitals or Gaussian type orbitals, GTOs, and these can be generated through multiple codes or methods. We can choose to do that using DFT, Hartree-Fock, MCSCF, CASSCF, selected CI, and what have you. Basically, this is your starting point. The, the part, the, 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 the trial from the trial wave function, this is the anti-symmetry part. And this is also what contains the nodes of our wave function as uh, shown here. So your wave function part is gonna come from this part here, is gonna come from uh, this determinant here. So in KMCPAC, we have different implementation of the single particle orbitals, either using a linear combination of atomic orbitals, as I said, or we can also use uh, plane waves. But for the case of the plane waves uh, that are more used for the solids or for molecular in boxes, uh, this is going to be the subject of the workshop week five that is going to be presented by uh, Josh Townsend uh, next week. And uh, for this specific case, when we use LCIOs, we can generate them throughout multiple codes. So natively supported through Nexus. So that means that Nexus can call them and you can just work with Nexus directly. Uh, you can use PiSCF, games, quantum package, quantum espresso, but again, for plane waves. However, uh, we can also support multiple other codes that you can use to generate your wave function. And this goes from TurboMole to QCAM, and this is using a converter. So basically you run your codes normally, then you print in these codes your wave function or your solution for Molden, and you use this tool Molden to QMC that is presented here to be able to generate uh, a starting point that QMC back can read. We will not go through this example, particularly for the Molden to QMC, but I invite you to look at QMC pack manual, where you will find an example and you will find how to use this one. So for this specific um, uh, lecture, we're just going to go through the path of Nexus and we're going to use PiSCF. So as a reminder, when you start the lab and you try to do these exercises uh, by yourself, remember to just start your virtual machine and then you will need to open the terminal. Once you have the terminal, uh, it is important that you update the workshop example files. So you go to your home directory and your QMC pack workshop and you put a git pull. Then for this specific talk, since we have introduced some small tiny changes to make things a little bit easier on Nexus, you will need to just uh, apply Ubuntu setup again. And this basically what it will do is it will just download the new version of Nexus. Don't worry, this will not launch the very long install that is needed usually when you run this because it's just picking up uh, Python files that don't need to be recompiled. So it should take only a few seconds for you. I know a question. Um, yes. Could people just do a, a, a git pull? I think people may need to just do a git pull on the yeah. on QMC on apps okay. in QMC pack there and not run the script, or do they actually need to run the script and rebuild? No. So I tried both methods, and thanks for the question, Paul. Uh, basically, if people are not very comfortable to go through apps and figure out where things are, if they're not as proficient in computing, they can just run the Ubuntu setup. If they are more uh, proficient and they know, or at least they have explored a little bit what the script did, they can just go to apps, QMC pack, and inside QMC pack, you'll have the files of QMC pack, and you just do a git pull inside QMC pack, and that will do exactly the same thing. If you run the Ubuntu setup, uh, from uh, this place, it will just realize that everything has been updated and it will just trigger a git pull on the correct directory. So you do this the way you feel comfortable with, uh, with uh, your levels of knowledge of how this works. But just doing a git pull on the QMC pack directory should be enough and sufficient for this. Thank you. So once you do this, you can just go into the week four lab directory and all the files are gonna be in this week four molecules. You will find all the files that we're gonna go through during this directory. So again, uh, I repeat this, you will see a lot of Nexus input files. So I would really encourage you to uh, revisit the week three tutorial if you did not do it, and to look again at the talk from Jaren Krogo from last week, which was very good to show you how to use all the tools and all the statistics tools especially. Okay, so again, questions that we will 
answer, or at least that I will try to answer during this lab, is how to choose a trial wave function, which method should we select for uh, the anti-symmetry part of the wave function, how to define a basis set. So when you do a calculation using Gaussians and basis sets, which one to pick? Um, what type of gastros do we choose? One, two, three body gastros. What is their use, the concrete use? How to select the correct time step for diffusion Monte Carlo? What is the population that you need to select? And how to reduce the error bar in, diff in diffusion Monte Carlo? And finally, um, how to systematically reduce the fixed node approximation, or at least how to assess of the quality of your calculations. So, Hopefully, by the end of this lab, you'll be able to run any system that you can think of, uh, of reasonable size, of course, uh, using the Fusion Monte Carlo. And hopefully, you will have the confidence that you, the parameters that you have chosen uh, will give you the correct answer. So in order to go through this lab, I uh, chose to go through an example, which is the beryllium dimer. So we're going to do all these things uh, applied to the beryllium diamond, uh, dimer. And the reason for that is that uh, it has been well studied using multiple methods, including QMC. This is a paper from not too long ago in 2015 by our colleagues at Pittsburgh University from Ken Jordan's group. And they did quite an extensive study of the burial on timer. As you can see here, they used multiple trial wave functions, multiple systems, and they have a good knowledge of the experimental value. So we do have a point to compare. So that's always a good thing to be able to, when you do a calculation, your first calculations, to be able to do it by yourself, but having a good reference point to compare to. Okay, so the first part here, we're going to discuss quickly about how to set up a calculation using a single determinant diffusion Monte Carlo calculation, but we're going to use first um, DFT, we're going to generate wave function using DFT and other methods like Hartree-Fock, we're going to generate multiple ones of these using Hartree-Fock, LDA, GGA, and hybrids, basically that's going to be a uh, PBE, PBE0, and the scan wave function uh, uh, functional. We're going to do multiple trial wave, multiple basis sets, double zeta, triple zeta, and then a quadruple zeta. And then we're going to do our QMC calculations where we're going to review again the wave function, the cross corrections, and a few things that we're going to discuss. The system again is the beryllium dimer. The beryllium dimer has four electrons in all electron calculations. So we are going to use first all electron calculations before moving to uh, electron core potentials. But for now, it's an all electron calculation um, and a total of eight electrons. So we know the experimental energy uh, and we, the, the total energy experimentally, um, and we know the bond length. So it's very easy to compare our calculations to what they should be. So first of all, again, what we're going to do is this is our trial wave function. The trial wave function has a just row part that controls more or less give us dynamic uh, correlations. And the static correlation comes from the anti-symmetry part of the wave function. So this is the part that we're going to start with. Again, the only approximation or the biggest approximation in quantum Monte Carlo or diffusion Monte Carlo is the fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo and the nodes come from this part. So basically we're going to try multiple nodes, Hartree Fock, DFT, the effect of the basis set on these nodes. And this is the first part. We're going to generate this part before generating this part. So as a first stop, this. So for here, um, we will see just first of all, how well does DFT perform for the beryllium two dimer and using this three functional four functionals and within three basis sets so all the files uh, that uh, are related to this workshop will be shown here every time we do anything it's going to be here and if a change of a file happens it's going to be also mentioned so in this, for example, we are starting with the first part, which is just the DFT and uh, the BE2.py file that is the beryllium 2 setup in PyCF. I wanted first to show you how uh, it can be a little bit difficult to generate files using uh, PyCF. So this is basically what you need to define in a PyCF code. Of course, you'll have the same thing with either games or any other code. And this is a generic input file where you need to do a bunch of imports here because it's um, Python and PyCF knows methods and density fitting methods, um, et cetera. You need to specify the coordinates of your uh, atom, uh, the type of basis set that you want to use. Uh, if you are using 
angstrom or uh, bore units, charge, spin, etc. Then here you specify the method. Of course, this here you are saying restricted orbital heart refock. Uh, you can use res uh, the just restricted heart refock, unrestricted. You can use Kanchan methods that will force you to also add a functional. You can use unrestricted Kanchan. You have a lot of functionals that you can use with PySCF. Uh, the important part here is save to QMC pack. This will tell quantum uh, PySCF to generate an HDF5 file or wave function that contains all the information that are needed by QMC pack. And if you are using this by yourself in your computer at home, don't forget that you need to specify to PySCF where to find this save to QMC pack file, which is in the path where you have your QMC pack. SRC QMC2. So just make sure that you have this Python path included when you are running this by yourself at home. So this is great. Now we know what we need to generate, but we will never have hopefully to generate anything like this because this same file here can be generated by Nexus. So the same file here that we have uh, is generated by Nexus. Again, here we have a small change on the file. Now we have the Nexus file. Um, that contains this. The reason why we use Nexus, even if it seems also as complicated as the other one, but the truth is that with Nexus, we can build on top of each block and the, the simulation, if it finds that things have already been computed, will not compute it again. But with just running with PyCF by itself, you'll need to do all these type of movements of data by yourself. And of course, if you have large amount of data or if you're not very certain of how to do it, might lead to errors. So the same blocks here, and I'm just gonna do a quick recap about this. So in Nexus, uh, here we're gonna just specify the number of cores that we're gonna have. This is the settings just to say where the results are gonna be in the directory where we're gonna run it. Sleep three means that Nexus will ping the machine every three seconds to see if a calculation has finished or not. It's quite annoying if it was a human, but that's very, very nice to be able to pick up quickly. And the type of machines. So this here is very interesting because um, from a practical point of view, so we are running on the machine that is gonna be the virtual machine or your local machines, but Nexus knows actually how to submit jobs on a large class of computers from HPC class computers in multiple um, uh, user facilities, uh, such as at Argon, we have Theta or Summit at ORML or other uh, local machines that are really large. So it's very useful to be able to define which machine you have and Nexus can do the submission of the job, generate the submission scripts and managing that for you. So that's very good. Um, we can here just specify an XYZ file and um, uh, Nexus will read it. It can even read postcard files, SIF files, all type of files. It will know these things by itself. And here is the important things is the parameters that we introduce that are very similar to the ones that we have on PySCF. We specify a path. This is important so it can start again or at least look for these calculations from there. Here we can say at if we want a serial job or a more parallel job, depending on what you're gonna, uh, which machine you're running at. And these are the parameters that you know. So once we have this, we can run this project here. Oh, sorry. And of course, if you want to know the SCF energy, at any time you can always type grep, converge SCF energy. For example, in this case, your data, as I said here, is gonna be uh, from last week's um, uh, tutorial, you saw how Nexus puts the data. So when you run something, it's gonna be in a directory it runs. And since we specified this directory here, the path, so all your data is gonna be here. So I wanted to mention this because it's important to know where your data is because we're gonna do a lot of analysis and you need to do to know where your data is. So once you run this, it's gonna be dumped here. Of course, if you're familiar with Python, you see that with this, we'll be able to loop around a lot of things. For example, if you want to have uh, different basis sets, you can create giant loops and just generate as many files as you want. And this is what we actually did. So we just generated a large loop around all uh, the four basis sets that the, the, the four basis sets that we discussed, uh, which are 
which are the heart refract, PBE, PBE0, and scan. And we can see here how uh, the results are at the SCF level, so before QMC. So here we see that for each basis set that we have, you can have the energies. And if you want to have this done, so I generated and you can find in the directory that um, uh, the directory of the workshop uh, of this lecture, there is a file called extract data scf.sh that if you run this will just parse through all the data that was generated and will generate a nice data like this and recover all your energies for you and you can plot it so i also attached this script here there is a GNU plot script that will allow you to just produce these files so again if we analyze the data so this is if you run your heart refoc or your dft depending on the functionals and you plot them to see the dependence, one, of the functional or the method, two, the size of the basis set. If we zoom in here, just if we look at this here, we see that LDA is actually doing particularly bad for this class of material, which is a little bit strange, but it is what it is. Um, and if we zoom in here, we see that, well, actually, um, LDA, and you have the, the, the experimental data that is here at the bottom, we see that is here, this line here is the experimental value. We see that they all do more or less poorly, but scan is relatively better. So scan is about 18, uh, 25 millihartry away from the experimental data. 25 millihartry starts becoming quite a significant error when we think about it. But this is how DFT does for this class of material. So now let's see how well or how better does QMC do for this class of material. So now that we know how to generate this part, we'll need to generate both. And the question is, which functional do we take once we see this? Does it matter? How much does it affect the result? You see this four. Should we take the one that is closest? Well, that's what we should be doing, but we're going to see this. So these are the points that we're going to see, how to convert and extract the data to correct the orbitals for the cusp, the electron cusp. Uh, uh, nuclei cusp um, and adding the two body, the one, two, and three body just so, and then running the diffusion of the car. So, again, this here, save QMC in your Nexus file, is the key point, and this is what we will generate the QMC data for Nexus. So, converting and extracting. So, once we do this part here on your Nexus file, we generate the wave function. As you can see here, we're going to do the analysis of all the points just for the scan functional, and we're going to do it with the triple zeta. This is just to assess. So for now, we're just taking this, and we're going to fix all the parameters based on these two functionals. A choice had to be made, and we're going to see why this choice is good later. But for now, we'll just pick this, a large enough basis set, not the double zeta, but not the quadruple, so just decent enough. And we're just taking one of the functionals. At the end of this SCF cycle, we have save QMC equals true, and this will generate the files for QMC pack. Now, we need to convert as a second step, convert and extract the QMC data. So for this, we need this other block that is going to come after the one from SCF inside Nexus. And this here, we're just going to say convert and add a cusp. So this is very important here, and we're going to talk about it, but we'll have here to specify what are the things that we need in our converter, what type of file we need for QMC pack. In this case, when we run an all electron calculation, we need this cusp. Why? So basically, at the nuclei, uh, Gaussian type basis sets are unable to describe the cusp correctly. So what they do is that they just put it, this type of Gaussian, because it's a Gaussian function, it will have this type of bump here. But in variational and diffusion Monte Carlo, the energy contribution to the local energy diverges when we are close to zero, when R is close to zero. And in order for avoiding this divergence, we need to apply an opposite divergence in the local kinetic energy. However, if we use Gaussian basis set, the kinetic energy in this case will be finite. So what happens is that the local energy will start diverging and just 
shooting away the moment we have an electron that gets a little bit too close to the core. So again, if you use pseudo potentials or electron core potentials, this cusp situation doesn't exist because it's well behaved and your core potential will be correcting for this area. Without core potential, and if you do all electron calculations, and because of the solutions of the Schrodinger equation, will push electrons to move closer to the nuclei. If you happen to be anywhere close here, your energies will start diverging seriously, and then your energy is going to be bad. So the solution is just to apply a correction, and we're going to replace this area here of the cusp with a known function that we know how to compute the derivatives for, and this is going to replace this part. So Fortunately, you will not have to do any of this thing or try to figure out which values to add. The only thing that you need to do is make sure that you add this calculate cusp at the end of your nexus file. So again, if you feel a little bit overwhelmed by the number of blocks that you need to add, don't worry at all. All these are in this file here and you can follow block by block and this will generate all the data that you need at the end of the calculation. So at this point, we are still working on the same file and we're just building our calculation one after the other, just like a big Lego block. And now we are at this step of generating the cusp. If you generate or not generate the cusp, well, what happens? Well, you have here two files that are provided in the directory. QMC0 with and without a cusp. And we can see the effects of not using a cusp. This is the trace of the variance. As I said earlier, the variance is um, a good description or a good descriptive of how good your wave function is. If your trial wave function is exact, your variance will be zero. The lower your variance, the better is your wave function. So now if you just run a variational Monte Carlo without the cusp, which is here, or with the cusp, which is here. So we see that here, you might think that these are large fluctuations, but look at the scale that you have here. You have a significant order of magnitude larger here, and we have these massive spikes here. In terms of if you can produce these two files here using the QMCA tool, and again, I invite you to try it again and to look at the talk from Jan Krogel from last week uh, to have an idea on this. But basically what happens is that uh, once you're on this, you see here that you go from a variance of 12 to a variance of five. And basically this is almost three times lower. If you remember from the statistics tools that we you studied uh, previously, reducing the variance by this large will require running about nine times longer. But in this case, you will never be able to reduce this type of spikes because they are physical ones. You are just hitting this divergence point. Um, <clears throat> also, it's uh, interesting to uh, mention that we will be referring a lot to a ratio of the variance to the local energy. And the reason for that is that if the energies fluctuate a lot, or at least if the energies are very large, uh, knowing if the variance is low or not, it's always in comparison to the local energy. So the ratio is always a good indication and a ratio of lower than 0 0.0403 is good. In this case here, we can see that 0 0.5 is a pretty bad. That means that your energy is almost all um, uh, too much, too many spikes. And I can make a quick comment. Yes. So one, so one thing we are actually seeing here is that if we put in a more physical wave function, right, we get lower energies and uh, much better variance, right? Just, just like the method was, was actually meant to and uh, was always set up, right? So if we put the wave function cusp in, uh, get the shape of the wave function near the near um, electron electron coalescence, right, we get much better wave functions. So that comes out really dramatically even in a simple system such as Beryllium. Yes. Thanks, Paul. Yes, so it's, it's a very good demonstration of, of, of that, and this is a good thing. So now that we have corrected for the electron nuclei cusp, there is a small intermediate step here, just so you, so basically Nexus, because you can build Nexus as a block, Nexus needs to need which parts um, are considered dependence. 
So for example, here we are telling Nexus, putting this variable here, the particles, so he knows where the electrons are, and sorry, the, the nuclei are, the orbitals, and this is gonna be all the orbitals. And now we add also the cusp. So now all the non-QMC dependencies are known. So Nexus can start by doing now um, the QMC calculations. So this is the part that is different. And so we just finished by building this part here. We have modified the orbitals. Now we're gonna start building the gestures. So technically you can have as any combination or linear dependence on the gestures, you can have one body, two body, three body, four body, and you can have as many, many body gestures. In QMC pack, we have implemented up to a three body gesture. And basically here we're gonna select one body electron ion, an electron electron, a two body, two body gesture, and a three body, which is the electron electron ion. So all these gesture functions are parameterized. The one and two body gestures are basically one dimensional B-splines and they go from zero. So from the, in the case of the electron nuclei, uh, here, the distance R uh, depends on the electron to the ion. And we're going to try to have um, a spline that is going to describe the interactions or this dynamic correlation. And these are parameterized, and we're going to optimize these parameters. So uh, same thing for the two-body gesture, but this time it's going to be between one electron and the other electron. And the three-body is between the electron, electron, and the ion. Because all these functions are parameterized, we need to figure out what are the parameters depending on the distance r cut. So where do we want this function to just fade away? Um, again, we are using variational Monte Carlo. So one way to do it is using variational Monte Carlo and optimize through the variation Monte Carlo. So how do we choose these parameters? When we do, well, this, this is what we do here, and most of them are selected automatically. However, it's important to just look at a few of them. So first, we are going to do only one and two body gestures together, see the effects, and then add the three body gesture to be able to see really how the one, two, and three body gesture will affect your calculations and how to select them. When we do this type of calculations, uh, the cutoff, or at least to what is the effect of the one body gesture need to be selected. When we do a solid, it's very different than when we do a molecule. And we're going to see this uh, next week uh, with Josh, how to select these things. But uh, this is more or less, you have to implement the cutoffs that can fit for you. So the rule of thumb here is to select a one body gesture cutoff that is short enough. Basically here, we are describing still for the barium two, we are describing relatively long one body gesture, six angstrom, uh, six bores. We're saying that this is gonna fade at six bores. And same thing for the electron electron, we're gonna still try to get some interaction up to eight angstrom, uh, eight bores. So again, these are parameterized functions. If there is an interaction that is beyond, that is below the eight, uh, bores. Let's say, for example, you think that um, the eight bores is too long. It's just going to be zeros everywhere, and there's no, not too many problems. So, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that it's okay if it's a little bit longer, if you have a larger cutoff, than if it's shorter. And we're going to see a little bit how this works. So, when you select one and two body gestures, it translates in the QMC pack input as these coefficients. So basically here we are saying that we're gonna have 12 points to describe our B, one, the, the, our B spine, one dimensional B spines. And we're gonna have to optimize these parameters using variation Monte Carlo. We select here the one method, uh, the one shift method, uh, which is an energy minimization scheme that is implemented in QMC pack. Again, for more details, I invite you to look at the QMC pack um, uh, manual. And we're going to implement a few steps that I recommend not to change too much for now until you understand a little bit better how it works. But these are very good to optimize most of the parameters for the gesture parameters. Once you run this, basically here, sorry, we're going to do multiple blocks. 20 blocks of optimization, but we're gonna do multiple cycles of optimization. As you see here, we start from a zero value of your parameters that needs to be optimized in your gestural, and we're gonna loop multiple times to be able to do this. So 
This means here that we're gonna do multiple runs, VMC runs to try to optimize them. We're gonna do four initial ones with kind of loose parameters, followed by eight better or more uh, robust optimization cycles to be able to equilibrate uh, better. This translates here by uh, evaluating the variation of Monte Carlo with these new parameters that were optimized. And we're gonna do this series going from one to 11. That corresponds to the total number, uh, sorry, from zero to 11, that corresponds to the 12 total cycles that we have. And we're gonna generate, uh, evaluate the energies of each one of them. You can see here that as the optimization loop uh, increases, the variance decreases. Or you can see it also in the ratio here, it's easier to see at the ratio level. This means here that at the optimization cycle 10, the parameters that were generated from the variation Monte Carlo gave the lowest energy, or at least the best type of uh, parameters. Because these were generated one step before, the lowest energies uh, achieved at series 10, that means that the best parameters were optimized in iteration nine. So the best wave function that we have, or at least the best parameters that were found were in uh, loop number nine, or at least the cycle number nine. So the good part is that you do not have to pick this. Nexus will decide for you and will choose this automatically. But in some cases, uh, if it's a little bit blurry and you don't know exactly which one, or you would have preferred to choose a different set of parameters, you can select which parameter to pick manually through Nexus. And uh, this you can just refer to the Nexus manual on how to do this. So now that we have the one and two body gesture optimized, we do exactly the same thing, but this time we add the three body gesture. So it is important to not optimize one, two, and three body gestures at the same time, just because there are some effects that are included in the three body gesture that will be, uh, if you try to optimize the three at the same time, you're introducing way too much fluctuations and uh, the robustness of the optimizer might not be able to allow you to optimize all three parameters at the same time, three functions at the same time. So we usually do one and two body gestures together and then we do the three body by itself. The loop for the three body gesture is exactly the same in the sense that it's gonna be an optimization cycle where we're gonna have multiple loops and we're gonna generate again, stochastically, a lot of the parameters of the three-body gestures and one and two-body gestures. So in this case here, we're gonna do again this 11 cycle loop and we're gonna do uh, the one, two and three-body gestures all together. Again, if you plot, or at least if you go to the directory for the three-body gestures and you do now uh, an evaluation of your energy, you see here that we started from this ratio here at series zero, this is the first cycle. This is basically when we had only the one and two body gesture with no three body gesture. This is the ratio. And then we start optimizing the parameter until we reach this ratio that is here, that is almost an order of magnitude smaller. Uh, and uh, the best parameter are optimized within about five series. The energies goes slightly lower, but mainly the variance, or at least the ratio, is significantly smaller, which means that we are improving again our wave function or we're getting a better wave function uh, thanks to the gestures. So what do the gestures really do? We run a variational Monte Carlo just using no gesture functions, just the one and two body gestures, and just the three body gestures. And we see a little bit the effect of the gestures on the variational Monte Carlo. We see here that the energy, the local energy, is reduced significantly going from nobody gesture to three body gesture. But mainly, we see here that the variance reduced significantly by using three body gesture. We have almost four times smaller uh, error bars and a significantly lower variance. And from the from the lecture from the statistics, lowering by a factor four your variance means that uh, you need, or at least you're speeding up your calculation by a factor 16 to reach the same accuracy. So again, not using variation, not using a gastro, 
you have an energy that is here at the level of the variation of Monte Carlo, but using a three-body gesture reduces even significantly more your energy. Uh, and of course your variance, of course your variance, and you get a significant speed up of your computer time. This is on the variation of Monte Carlo. So the energy is lower. Now on the diffusion Monte Carlo part, what does, does it do? So because compared to the variation of Monte Carlo where we are sampling around the square of the trial wave function, so you're still bound to the trial wave function that you used, it's not the case in diffusion Monte Carlo. Here in diffusion Monte Carlo, not using a gesture or using a gesture, we see that the energies are more or less the same. And at very long time, if we run long enough, we should reach the exact same energy. So the gestures on an on electron calculation have no effect on the local energy. And in, if you run long enough, you will converge to the same energy as uh, with using, no, using gestures or not using gestures. So however, when you look at the effect on the variance, now this is significantly different. And we have almost a speed up of eight uh, times faster using uh, gestures compared to not using gestures. Even when we use, when we use um, between two body gestures and three body gestures, the difference is only 0.4 plus minus 133 millihartries. So, this here is important to pay attention to the error bars because when you see here, you might think that the two-body gesture and the three-body gestures don't have the same energy and that actually the three-body gesture is lower. No, uh, they are within the same error bar. So these energies are statistically the same. Um, however, uh, when we look also at the no gestures and the three-body gestures, these are also the same energies within two sigmas. But really what you see here is that we are using a better wave function. So the gesture one reduces the variance significantly and you will get significant amount of speed up in your calculations uh, if you use a gesture function. At this point, do you have any questions? I know that it was a little bit hard to begin. <laughs> Thanks, Anwar. Let's just give everyone a few moments to type. There have been a variety of, of questions posted in, in the chat, but we've been answering them uh, as we go on, uh, go through. Just to try and merge a couple of questions together, could you say a little bit more about whether we optimize uh, the one, two, and three body gesture functions simultaneously or one at a time? Is this a tutorial? You know, what, what do we do in practice and what should we do in these exercises? Yes, so uh, I apologize. I went a little bit fast on this part here, but again, when we have the gesture functions, this is the form of the gesture functions, which are parameterized uh, functions. Uh, either uh, as um, a polynomial or as this uh, two functions here, which has one db spines. These functions are all, they all have parameters that needs to be optimized for each different calculation that you have. You will need to optimize the parameters that come in this UABs and in this large function here. Um, once we have these, because we can just use stochastic sampling to be able to optimize these parameters, the reason for that is that we have variational Monte Carlo. So that means that any new set of parameters that minimize the energy that gives us a, a lower energy will be better. These are the parameters we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to do multiple trials. We're going to put them in a cycle. So we're going to loop around this optimizations. And we're gonna tell QMC pack here, uh, do 11 cycles from zero to uh, 12 cycles, or you can pick whichever number you want by just specifying them here. And this is gonna generate new set of sample for the J1 and the J2. Now you can think of it this way. You have this determinist, this, this anti-symmetry part, the deterministic part, the determinant part that have been computed from 
GFT, heart refocal, what have you. And now you are introducing a large set of dynamic correlation. These describe dynamic correlation, how the correlation between your one electron and the ion, the electron-electron, and this electron-electron ion. If you were to try to optimize all these three, one, two, and three body gestures at the same time, uh, basically you're introducing so much fluctuations that you might not converge quickly or you might just break the optimizer. So the rule is to do one and two body gestural together because those are easy. And then you add the three body gestural and you re-optimize one, two, and three again. So it's like uh, doing an adiabatic change. First, you just do these two together. And in your file, this is, you're going to see here um, the, the, in the QMC one, you're going to see just the one and two parameters. Once we have optimized those, now we add the three body gesture. So if you were to redo this in this file here, you will need to comment out this section first. You do the one and two body gestures, and then you do the three body gesture. The reason for this is, of course, as I said, so you introduce, you don't introduce too much change and you don't break the optimizer when you do the step. Does that answer the question, Paul? I think so. Um, I will keep an eye out for any follow up in the chat. There's a number of extra questions now. Uh, so, one I missed earlier from a Roman Fanta uh, for choosing the wave function, can we use the ratio or linear combination of energy and variance? or just variance as parameter for choosing the best wave function. So sort of how do we choose the best wave function and what might we use in the optimizer? <laughs> so this is a good question, actually. So uh, I'm going to assume this is based on this, right, for the ratio and choosing the right parameter. Um, this is a little bit of uh, a choice. So the original, if you were to choose to do just variation, minimizing the variance by itself, um, the cost would be prohibitive and that will be very hard. So what we usually do is the local energy, but um, uh, the method that is used in QMC pack uh, is an optimization or is a minimization of the energy. However, there's also different schemes. Uh, I went a little bit fast on it because the point is not to explain how the JAS optimizer works, but here the minimization method that you have chosen, that we have chosen here, minimizes the energy. And this is the one shift method. Uh, it's described again in the QMC pack code, but uh, the QMC pack manual, but basically um, it's a way to minimize the energy by still allowing the variance to change a little bit. The other method implemented where you can do a weight, how much you want to, you can do, for example, I want to minimize 90% through the energy and 10% of the variance. So we can choose these parameters. There are actually examples that you must have studied last week uh, with uh, Jan Krogel's test where he uses the other method where you have a, a combination of um, the energy and the variance optimization. I personally prefer the one shift method because it's significantly faster. However, and this is where I am going with this, once you use this method, it tends to put a little bit too much weight on the local energy minimization, but it's also important to look also at the ratio. So sometimes personally, for example, in this set, I might go with um, well, this set is obvious to go with uh, this one, but for example, in the case of the two-body gastro here, um, uh, going maybe with the seven here or something, hold on, sorry, these are all good examples, so it's a little bit harder, sorry, yeah. So here I would probably have chosen series 10 instead of series five personally, if I were to do it manually and I would have told Nexus to select this one instead of selecting this, because even if the ratio is not as good, These are all the same, but in general, sorry, the example is beryllium two is actually a very, very robust test and it's very difficult to kill it in this specific case. But in some cases you might find that the energy might be lower, but the variance might be slightly higher. And you might want to choose one uh, series that has uh, a combination of the two. So I hope this answers the question, even if I feel that I put more doubts about it than, than, than necessary. 
So perhaps a, a related question, and I'm going to try and summarize a question from Igor Evangelista, and that is that the optimization, you know, seems to converge fairly quickly and then bounce bounce around, right? So are we are we wasting um, compute time here? Could we have done fewer? You know, how many how many should should we be doing? And perhaps to connect with the later part of your talk, if we're going to do diffusion Monte Carlo how much should we worry about this anyway right because we're not changing the nodes at this point yes so that's a good question indeed so uh unfortunately we cannot know uh if we did enough or not enough until we do something <laughs> so this is the first answer that i'm gonna say but keep in mind that if you run a variation of monte carlo uh sorry a diffusion monte carlo with all electrons as i showed earlier um the JASOs will not help whatsoever in reducing your energies. However, they're going to have a huge impact on your variance. So when you do a variation of Monte Carlo, the cost, and this is really just hand wavy, but the cost to do the variation of Monte Carlo compared to the diffusion Monte Carlo is really significant, orders of magnitude larger. So let's say if in, in practice, I, what I see is about 100 times more expensive to do TMC than to do VMC, if not more in some cases. So the time that you spend optimizing JASTROs, if you can get this type of speed up in terms of your error bar, you have uh, a speed up of 8x, sorry, uh, your error bar is eight times smaller. So this is actually a mistake. This is 64 times faster. So if it's to get your diffusion Monte Carlo 64 times faster, I would recommend you to waste a little bit of the cycles trying to optimize your JASTROs because it will get, you will get back that, 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 that value uh, after the DNC. At the same time, if you don't optimize long enough and you get the wrong JASTROs, this might just put your calculations off track and you might find yourself uh, worsening your variance, worsening your wave function, because again, a better wave function, a better trial wave function means smaller variance. Smaller variance means you're gonna be faster. So the whole point here is you rather waste the cycles doing VNC correctly for the optimization, rather than having to pay for the, a bad gesture or a no gesture at the DMC level. Um, does it answer that's, you? That's great. Um, and just a, a, maybe a last question, and I'm going to base this off a question from Adam Denchfield. If we had a particular form for the three-body gesture in mind, is there a way to add that question? And I'm going to generalize that to say, well, what if can we change any part of the gesture function whilst we're doing this? Um, so I'm going to understand that it is uh, the form of the gesture coming from yes. here. So yes, so in QMC pack, we can change the form of the gesture. So we do have a few ones that are already implemented in the code that you can select from. Uh, I'm hoping that I have it here. So you can see in the two-body gesture, you can select the B-spline type that I discussed, but we do have also other forms for PADE and um, uh, a few more that have been implemented recently, but we also have a path towards implementing new gesture functions. This is, of course, you need to know the form that you want for your gesture function. And then if you do it correctly and you follow the manual and you work with the developers, uh, you'll be just able to put whatever um, uh, parameters that you need to optimize for your calculations and the optimizer will just take them and hopefully will be robust enough to optimize them. But I think it's for most of the forms, we don't see that many problems optimizing gestures. And I'm putting this between air quotes um, because there's no such a thing as no problem in, in life in research. But yes, so, and the same thing for the three body gesture, as you can see, um, here for the three-body gesture, we choose a polynomial form, but technically there is no problem in implementing any new form of of, of gesture if you have the, the if you know the form. And I think off the top of my head, there's actually a simple example of adding a, a new gesture function in in the manual. Right, one does have to add, edit the code to do that, of course. But there's an example of a simple one parameter way function going in. So if that was something someone was interested in, there's a, a path to, to do that that's documented. 
and maybe it's in, interesting to add since anyways i'm eating on the break time um it is uh it is fun to try to do these type of things and the developer community is very friendly there's an active um google group and a git GitHub group that uh, people will be willing to assist you and to guide you if this is something that interests you. So don't hesitate to contact us through that, to those means. Okay, so now that we have generated the JASO function and we have built our trial, trial wave function from the anti-symmetric part and we have optimized our JASO, so we have our one, two, and three body JASOs. Now it's time to move to the diffusion Monte Carlo. So basically, the questions that remain is how to select a time step, how to select a population, and how to reduce an error bar. And in the following, these are the three things that we're going to try to, to solve. So basically, here uh, we have a new file. So now we're going to go into this QMC2 for the Bayesian timer. And what we're going to add is this block here that is regarding the diffusion Monte Carlo. So in this example here, um, we have looped around uh, different type of uh, trial wave functions. Uh, so you're going to do scan, uh, PBE, PBE0, and uh, uh, Hartree-Fock and different basis set, double zeta, triple zeta, quadruple zeta. The point is for later to see the effects of them, but just be careful when you run this on your virtual machine, it might take some time. So you might want to try on one wave function and one size of basis set so you don't get stuck running for too long. So here we're just going to try to see first how to extrapolate the time step. So which time step you want to choose uh, in this calculation. So we're going to do this at the DMT level. We just select for now a large number of samples, uh, 4,096, a uh, large number of blocks, just to make sure that we are converged. So we're going to start with, we don't know the system, we don't know how far uh, we need to run, but we're just going to put some minimum things. And we're going to add this time step here to try to figure out what time step we need. This is done by Nexus quite nicely, where we choose the time step. We choose the time step factor. This basically means that you're going to start reducing this time step by 0.5, and you're going to do this four times. This number of steps here, if you remember from last week's talk by uh, Jan Kogel, will take care of the autocorrelation for you. So basically, you're going to make sure that the lower the time step you have, the larger the number of steps you have to remove autocorrelation but we're gonna see the effects later. But basically this is quite nice to be, if you don't know which in your system, which time step to choose, you just run this calculation and you're gonna run it for uh, four different time steps. In this case, 0 0.01, 0 0.005, 0 0.025 and 125. And we're gonna see if it extrapolates well to zero. One last mention here. So you see in the list of dependencies that we have for this calculation, we have the orbitals. So this is what we mentioned at the beginning where you have the orbitals, the position and the cusp correction. And now we add also the three body gesture and this contains one, two and three body gestures. So now we're gonna see a little bit how the auto credit, so how the time step correction works. So we have run this four again, one, two, three, four. Nexus generated the files and submitted them for us. And now we're gonna analyze the data. So for each one of these steps, if one of these runs, we're gonna analyze the autocorrelation time. If you remember, you do this by adding this dash dash SAC for the autocorrelation number. And you're gonna get for each one of these time steps, the 0 0.1, 0 0.005, 25, and 15, the autocorrelation value. So basically, that means that you need technically to reblock and to reevaluate your statistics based on this autocorrelation number. And this is what we do here. So we just take this autocorrelation numbers, two, four, four, and three. And we're just going to use the tool QMC fit that you've seen with Jan. So again, I would recommend you to uh, look again at the tools from the Nexus. But this tool is quite nice to be able to fit the the, the time step. So it uses an extrapolation based on resembling the data uh, with jackknife resampling. But basically, this is what you studied last week with Nexus and Jaren. And basically, we're going to just fit 
we're going to remove 20 equilibration steps and we're going to just use these time steps to fit the data. The value that we have here becomes this one. So this is the time step zero. And this tells us that at time step equals zero, we should have this energy here based on these things. Or if you plot it, you can see that this is the points that we have computed. And this is what we have. So we could also try by not going the, up to this very, very small time step here. And we can just use only three time steps and you'd get more or less the same energy. So we see here 30303 zero, three, zero, three, and here 3200. Zero, zero. So basically you have an, an error bar of 0.3 millihartree, which is within error bar. So we could have even removed this point and just do the extrapolation and we would still have been fine. So when you do this type of extrapolation, especially when you do an all electron calculation, the time step will be more or less in these areas. But this is the important thing here that you need to take from this slide is that if you were to run with this one, this 0.25 time step, you technically don't even need to do a time step extrapolation. So you would not need to do these larger points here. In practice, in other systems or at least in production runs, it comes often to doing this. So we pick a time step that is small enough that allows us to just not have to do the time step extrapolation unless the cost of the calculation of doing this one here is so large that I'd rather do just larger time steps. Or for example, if uh, the fit we were still far away from this time step equals zero, then yes, you need to do it. But if you are able to afford a small enough time step that allows you to avoid to do this time step extrapolations, that's what you generally would tend to do. In this case here, because the calculations are so cheap, they all run on our local machine, on our virtual machine. Uh, the rest of the calculations, we're just gonna use this time step with 80 steps to avoid autocorrelation and to take into account this autocorrelation value here. So now that we know which time step to pick, we're gonna do the population bias. So unfortunately, this was a funny, um, uh, a funny situation to do a population bias for the barium two, because the wave function is so good and the normal surface is so well that we were almost all the time, um, uh, we almost all the time had a good population. So I had to kind of um, degrade the quality of the wave function to see the effects of the wave function. So in general, it's not as nice nicely behaved and we could have used the same parameter that we have just decided and we would still have been able to see it but it, but i was not able to really uh, show bad behavior unless i poorly choose the sampling again what does the population bias mean the population bias mean means that you have a surface that you need to sample potential energy surface that you need to sample where the electrons should be and if you don't have enough samples, you're going to be sampling only one specific region uh, of the sp solution space. But technically, you should have been uh, sampling the whole. And maybe you're going to sample just a small area and not enough to be able to explore where solution might or where the energy might be lower. So one way that I found to be able to remove this is just not do any equilibration and just do a random sampling at the beginning and see how that affects the system. And you can see here that for very small populations, you start being biased, but the larger you get in the population, now you're able to sample everything. So technically here, going from a population of uh, 64 to a population of 2024, you would introduce a bias of 20 millihartree in your energy. Of course, this can be solved with something quite simple is by equilibrating. And this is why in this case of beryllium dimer, even with a very small population, if you equilibrate long enough, you'll be able to explore all these areas here and you would still recover your bias. 
But if you do not have that equilibration, or if you have in systems where you have a very, very small population, what might happen is that you're going to introduce bias because instead of just getting the absolute minimum, you might be just in some type of local minimum and you will not be able to get out of it. So it is important to do this type of analysis. For this specific system here, we see that just with the 1024 population, we are already well um, uh, uh, exploring the space and it's, uh, there is no population bias for this. In practice, in all the systems that we study, most of the case threshold of 2048 or about 4,000, with 4,000 uh, walkers, you're almost certain that there's nothing, uh, that you will not be introducing any population bias as long as you equilibrate long enough. So with 2,000 to 4,000 walkers, you should be fine in most of the cases uh, that you have seen, that we have seen. So we do have the population under control. And now how can we reduce the error bar? Well, if we increase from the statistics, and we know that for Monte Carlo simulations, basically it goes as square root of our population or, our, or square root of the number of blocks that we do. Here, if we increase the number of blocks by a uh, factor squared, so if we square the number of blocks that we have, you see that if we square, we always have a uh, factor two if you have it Sorry, you have a linear growth with the square of the number of population, uh, the number of steps that we have. So if you increase your number of blocks, in other words, if you want to reduce your error bar by a factor two, you need to run four times longer. If you want to reduce your number of blocks by a factor three, you need to run nine times longer, factor four, 16 times longer, five, 25, et cetera, is squared. Um, so, on the other hand, you can also play this with the number of blocks that you have, uh, sorry, the number of samples that you have. So it's exactly the same if you want to uh, run, uh, reduce your uh, error bar by a factor two, you can just multiply your population, your samples by factor four. Let's say you start with 512 uh, samples. If you move to 248, you will reach exactly the same value here. So this is to get the same point here. We just increased our population by four. Uh, this is, of course, you need to pay to take into account the fact that there is an equilibration time that is fixed. You cannot uh, speed up that process by increasing your population. So let's say you know that you want to reduce your population by a factor 10. You can run 100 times longer, or you can increase your population by 100 times. If you increase your population by 100 times, you will need just one block and you would get the exact same energy after equilibration. So I hope that this is an important point. Uh, I'm gonna just repeat it to be clear again. If you want to reduce your error by, by factor two, you run four times longer or you multiply your population by four, etc. it's squared except that you cannot reduce your equilibration time because even if you have a large population, they all need to equilibrate the same amount of time. So once the equilibration time is passed, then you can just uh, reduce your error bar by just increasing your population. Um, the strategy here, how long you need to run or is there one that is better than the other, population versus number of blocks? Well, it depends on your computer. If you have a small computer, well, you can always reduce your population so you don't create too much work for your CPU and run for a long time. But if you have a very large computer, like the ones that we have in national labs or even in mid-class computers in your universities, it still is a linear scaling. So what will happen is that you just increase your population. If you have 100 nodes, run on 100 nodes, and you will get your, your solution 10 times faster. And this is the good strategy to have. Uh, and this is why uh, it's important you can adapt. Technically, you could run any system that you want as long as you have the memory available. And as long as the computer is yours and you don't pay too much electricity, you could run any large system. It's just gonna run for a long time. If you wanna like, let it run for a year on your laptop, there's no problem with that. You will reach the exact same solution as if you were to run on a larger supercomputer. You can look at the scripts to generate this data here. 
And again, you can see at uh, this, you can reproduce this type of calculations by yourself and see how it increases with the size of the population or with the number of blocks. And you can play with this type of things. So now that we have set all the parameters, we can technically run the final run for the QMC. Um, here in this example, the number five, you will be running through LDA, PBE, PBE0 scan, and with these three basis sets. And it's just going to loop around them. And this is what I showed you earlier. Your path will just store each one of these results in a separate directory. And you will be able to do the analysis of each one of them. For example, here, if you were to do for the scan functional with the quadruple zeta, you will get this value here, as you have seen how to use the QMCA, um, the QMCA uh, uh, tool. You'll have the local energy, and you'll have your variance and your ratio. If you plot the data, as a reminder, if you want to plot the data, it's the same command line, but you just add dash t, you will be able to see the equilibration time here. And then this is the statistics that you want, and it gives an error bar of 0.5 millihart rate with a relatively small, small um, variance. This is still 19 millihart tree in the case of the quadruple zeta. With scan, it's still 19 millihart tree away from the experimental value. So basically, if we compare this now, this is the solution with scan. If we see here, this is LDA, PBE, PBE0, and scan. And this is the reference is a little bit uh, lower here. But we see using diffusion Monte Carlo with the triple zeta, quadruple zeta, triple zeta, sorry, double, triple, and quadruple, we see here that there's a really a very, 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 very small dependence to the size of the basis set. All the MC energies give more or less the same value. And this is what we want. That means that there is really almost no dependence to the basis set or to the starting trial wave function. Again, it is extremely important to rem remember that this is for the beryllium-2 system. And there are, unfortunately, some uh, systems where you might see some dependence in the starting point. But the basis set, usually, because diffusion Monte Carlo is a real space uh, method, usually with a triple zeta in 90% of the cases that we have tried in the past is enough to recover the equivalent of the CBS limit for other quantum chemistry methods. And if you use a quadruple zeta, you are sure that you will not need any type of correction to your basis set because it's already there. Most cases, again. If we compare these results to what DFT does, so these are our DFTs, and we see these are our for DMC functional. And of course, this is the energy uh, to the reference, the energy error that we have. So basically, we are all 20 millihart tree away from uh, the experimental data, while the DFT, the best one, is at 25. And of course, you have huge discrepancies between functionals. You can generate these plots using these uh, tools that I provided in the directories, and you can extract the data to be able to reproduce these also in the directory. So you can play with this, you can change functionals. For example, if you were to use a B3lib, B3lib gets significantly good results for this class of material, but fails on other. And the same for scan, gives good results for barium two, but fails for a significantly large amount. However, if you see here at the DMC level, all calculations are the same, and this is a good thing to have. Any questions about this? We will give people a few moments to type. Okay, so here's one. This is from Adam Denchfield. Is the takeaway from these plots that if you're using diffusion Monte Carlo, you might as well just use LDA in this case? Yes. So this could be definitely, I mean, I would not push, uh, I did not put the results from the Hartree fog, but the Hartree fog, the wave function is really so much garbage that diffusion Monte Carlo cannot do too much. You can see it as Diffusion Monte Carlo will try to put back the correlation that is missing from your starting theory. But if you start really from too much garbage, it's going to be a garbage in, garbage out. So I would not try to start from the worst one. 
But as you can see, most of the cases, if you're starting from a DFT, the nodes coming from DFT are almost the same for this class of materials. For example, if you were to go to transition metals, that's a complete different ballgame where both LDA and PBE give garbage and you need to start from a PBE plus U or some other method, but this is more complex type of thing. But in this case, for organic molecules and the first rows of the periodic table, um, starting from an LDA, PBE or a scan or a PB3 or PBE zero will give you more or less the same value. So yes, this is the point is, if you start from either of them, try not to start from the most garbage one, just because there's no need to push the device to the point where you say, hey, even if I start from the worst, I recover it. If you start just from one that is fine, uh, I will be honest for molecular systems, most everyone starts with B3-lip because they have a physical meaning where you have a percentage of exact exchange and a percentage of correlation, so it makes kind of sense. B3-lip is a good starting point. PB0 is a good starting point. I want to put scan because it's a newer one that a lot of people use, but it doesn't change that much. Thanks, Samuel. Yeah, so the, so the comment here is, you know, I, I see, so the DFT starting point will still be important for more complicated materials. And so that's, that's the case. And just to echo that rule of thumb um, for heavier elements, it, it seems that functionals like B3LIP and PBE0 with a bit of ex, a bit or a lot of exact exchange in them tend to give better starting points. But the key point here is it's all the same principles. One can test uh, these different starting points. Uh, and of course, you know, here, fortunately, the starting point doesn't matter very much, at least at this energy scale. But, but for heavier, heavier systems, I can see much bigger differences. Yes. Sometimes so, it can be up to one EV differences in some very, very large systems where the energies are very large, but you can see like up to three or 4% of, of, of deviation between one or the other. Maybe it's important also to remind people that this is also strength in QMC or in diffusion Monte Carlo. The method is variational. So any energy that is lower means that the nodal surface is better. And that means that you will be closer to the exact energy. Also, it is variational and it's upper bound to the exact energy. So you can never go lower than the correct answer. So there is no risk in trying many and deciding which one is better. The one that gives you the lower energy will always be better. So that's, the, that's, that's important. Like other methods, like couple cluster, for example, can give you lower than the exact or the experimental value. In QMC, you cannot go lower. So that's a good thing. You're always upper bound to the exact energy. I think that's a good point. So in um, a lot of, I think in, in most papers, the, the standard recipe that people follow is to you know, find a choice of functional or starting nodal surface that's going to work well for their systems. And then they then pick it and then use that for the rest of the uh, rest of the paper once they've got one working well. So a question from Roman Fanta. Can we use an augmented uh, TZV basis instead of a simple quad, quad Z to one without automated functions and still be able to achieve the same accuracy, e.g. in interaction energy. So you've been focusing on total energies. What about other properties and their basis set dependence? So yes, so the basis set depends. So this is a very good question, actually. So in principle, all the properties will be conserved. However, you can play the game of um, compensation of errors by reducing the quality of your wave function. And if you don't change your system too much, for example, if you were to uh, just do different geometries or different, uh, if you still have the same elements, you can play the game of uh, reducing the size of your basis set and you will be able to get the exact same compensation of errors as you have in quantum chemistry methods. The second part, uh, and this is a paper that I think I make a reference for at the end of this uh, talk, which was done by uh, Matthew Stubecki um, in, the, um, uh, in Europe, who played the game of just starting to remove functional uh, orbitals from basis sets and seeing how, how much we needed. And you actually realize that the nodes are not as dependent on the augmented part of the basis set, for example. So in most of cases, if you were to use an augmented 
basis set for QMC will, it's not going to add anything. If anything, you can start to remove shells and QMC will still recover. As long as it's decent enough, you will have a good description. Now, there are some problematic problems because the chemistry is not described unless you have that augmented and you put some um, uh, ghost shells or ghost orbital between two bonds or what have you. Those problems, however, will be present in QMC and Diffusion Monte Carlo is not very likely to be able to recover that. So you can think of it this way. If you have a region where you need to put an augmented, that's because the electrons are not well described in that area. Diffusion Monte Carlo will allow you to go beyond the basis set definition, but it's not magic. It's not going to be able to find or to allow you to put an electron where an orbital just really does not exist. So the electron still needs to live within some type of remnant of an orbital at the diffusion Monte Carlo level, but something needs to be there. If there is nothing and your system chemically is not described in that region, you will need to add those diffuse functions also at the QMC level to be able to run them. The important point, however, I think that is worth mentioning again, is that it's a real space method that depends on the electron, not on the number of basis functions like quantum chemistry methods. In principle, you can have a sextuple zeta. The cost is not going to change because what matters is the number of electrons we loop over the electrons, not over the orbitals. So there is a small prefactor that comes from the number of basis functions, but that is a small cost compared to the rest of the simulation. The simulation costs because you have electrons, not because you have basis functions like in quantum chemistry, where the methods call scale n to the fifth with the number of orbitals. We scale between n to the second to n to the fourth with the number of electrons. So if you can afford to do your trial wave function with the, diffusion, with the quantum chemistry method, you should be able to afford it at the QMC level, and it's going to be cheaper because you only pay for the electrons. Does that answer? I think it does anyone. I think that's a comprehensive answer. And looking at the, the time, I think we should keep moving. Yeah. Perfect. So um, setting up electron core potential with DMC. This is the phase, the last pass, where after this, hopefully we'll have full spectrum and we'll be able to run everything. So basically here, what we're going to do is the same type of calculation for the barium-2 molecule, but this time we're going to use pseudo potentials. As I just said now, and that was actually a good transition, the cost of a QMC calculation is in the number of electrons. So one way to reduce the cost is to just reduce the number of electrons and just use the valence and redefine the core electrons with the core potential that at that point will just be evaluated separately. This is what we are um, doing when we do an ECP. So there is, uh, we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to just say how we set an ECP and see how the time steps change, how the number of blocks change, and the same study that we just did, how to reduce the error bar. And we're going to compare this between all electron and pseudo potential or ECP calculations. The change in nexus is just this part here, where we are saying that we're going to add the pseudo potential directory. We have here the pseudo potentials that I provided. And that's about it in the difference in the calculations. Um, I thought that I put a note here. Sorry. Um, it is worth mentioning that a full study of the pseudo potential is going to be shown in week six. Uh, and all these pseudo potentials and how they behave and how to construct them will be discussed more in details in week six, so in two weeks from now. So I invite you to attend that lecture if you're interested in how to make these pseudo potentials and how to use them and why they are specific to the uses that we need here. So, yes. So basically, if we just run uh, this file here, uh, we're going to see the effect of the JASTROS and on the VMC and the diffusion Monte Carlo. So we run the JASTROS exactly the same way as I showed earlier, even if it was a little bit hard to follow, but uh, we run them the same way. So we have the same type of JASTROS, one, two, and three body JASTROS. We're going to optimize them and we're going to see the difference in the energies. So obviously, the scale is different because we are removing electrons. We moved from having eight electrons or four electrons per atom to having only two. And of course, then the energy is going to change. But now we see the effect on the error bars or in the variance ratios. So we see here that not using a JASTRO 
gives this ratio of 0.2, but not using a JASRA at the VMC level with ECPs actually gives a smaller ratio. What this means is that because we don't have those fluctuations near the cusp first, and because the ECP reduces significantly the size of our variance, we have gain. There is a value beyond just using JAS rules or not at using ECPs. So the variance is significantly smaller. Now, if you, if you use two body, one, two, and three body JAS rules, we see the same effect in the sense that using JAS rules reduces the variance on the system. The, however, uh, same or similar thing that we see between VMC all electron and VMC with CCECPs, co correlation electron, um, electron core potential, is that it affects the energy of the VMC. We see we go from 1.90 to 1.99, and this is the same thing here. We gain about 0.1 milliheart, uh, 0.1 heart rate in those. So the JASRO affects uh, the pseudo potential. Now, what happens at the level of the DMC? We saw that at the DMC on electron, the energy is the same. So in other words, the just rows do not have any effects on the DMC on the local energy from DMC. However, when we do pseudo potentials, we see here that there is 10 millihertz difference between these calculations. Um, the variance changes. Again, this is to be expected. So we always will have this effect of speeding up, adding just rows, we reduce the variance, but there is this effect here that we see. This is basically because our Hamiltonian here has, of course, this fixed node part, and it has this pseudo localization, pseudo potential localization. Basically, we are affecting a local, local error that is introduced due to the pseudo potential. And this is evaluated here on a grid point. And basically, once you apply your wave function, your psi on H here, you're going to also start affecting this part. So your just row here is going to be interacting with your local part of your pseudo potential. And then it's going to change or affect your energy. Um, this, again, is going to be more details in lecture six of the workshop. And I encourage you to see these effects. But again, a good quality pseudo potential and a good interpretation of how we integrate over this local part, uh, which we do in QMC pack, makes it extremely controllable. And this is the error that is introduced usually with the local pseudo potentials. If we look now at the time step and how they act on the pseudo potential part again. So on electron, we see that we need to go to very small time steps to be able to extrapolate. However, from the once we use a CCCP, we see that the time step is actually significantly larger. It's about one order of magnitude larger than what we need for the all electron. Um, so that using CCCPs, we have significantly less sensitivity to the time step. And this is all due to, of course, not having this uh, uh, core electron interactions near the core we have a huge type of oscillations that happen. And basically, to be, able, to be able to describe them, you need to have very small time steps. While as long as you stay away from the core, you don't need necessarily this very, very small, tiny time steps to be able to sample properly your, 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 your system. And this is why the time step here is significantly larger. Again, the value also with the time step is that we will have some significant cancellation of error if you're calculating energy differences. And this is a good thing to have. Finally, if we look at the atomization energy for the barium-2 between our electron and CCECP, so uh, here we have single reference atomic between the DFT and the DMC. And here we have the experimental value. You'll note that this is extremely shallow, and the barium-2 is actually a very, very, very sensitive uh, problem and people try to get it to six digits or to the micro heart tree to get it correctly and publish. But in this case, we were just interested in this very, very um, uh, crude, or at least first type of calculations that can run on a laptop. And you see here that basically at the atomization energy, the DFT gives 13 milli heart rate compared to four. All electron calculation give minus five, while uh, the CCCP goes, gives minus three. Basically, this here just tells us that using pseudo potential or not, I give more or less the same energies. And that means that the pseudo potential here is pretty good to do this type of calculations. And it's pretty safe to be able to use this class of pseudo potentials. 
You can also do dissociation curves. Um, this was done uh, yesterday, so apologize, I did not have time to shoot it, but basically it's the, uh, the, the, the triplet oxygen dissociation, dissociation energy. Um, you can find the full script to generate this, and that's run on my laptop. Uh, so it does not take that much time on also the virtual machine, where you have the triple state, where you have the experimental energy that is about this. You see the scan DFT and the QMC. The error bars are printed. They're just very, very, very small. And you see here the experimental energy is 188, while the DMC is 186, which is pretty good uh, for uh, calculations that run just on my laptop here. So again, this is using a pseudo potential. And you can see that when you do cancellation of errors, you get pretty, pretty nice things with pseudo potentials and ECPs. And they are very, very well defined. Um, so again, uh, you can do this full dissociation curve by hand, uh, sorry, with Nexus. But again, I think the message that I want to vehicle here is that while Nexus is a very powerful tool, it is really, really important to make sure that you can uh, test and you can make sure that and verify that your calculations are well converged. QMC will always give you an energy at the end, but that energy could be less or not well converged, and you will need to be able to check for that. Any question regarding the CCCPs? We'll give it a moment in case anyone has uh, any questions. But just to uh, remind everybody, uh, we're going to have a whole session on um, shooter potentials. And also remind everyone, you don't necessarily have to make your own shooter potentials. We'll be covering how to, how to get those from uh, shooterpotentiallibrary.org, where there's many modern shooter potentials designed for correlated quantum chemical and QMC calculations available. Thanks, Paul. I should have probably put the address of uh, my, my, my mistake. Uh, we should have put the address of the pseudo potential library. Uh, maybe we can add this to um, the, the chat, to the Slack channel, and I will add a link uh, to an updated version of these slides just to be able to point people at the pseudo potential that they need. Um, so I don't see any extra questions yet, but just to remind everyone, you know, we're putting together a jigsaw piece puzzle here and two, two extra pieces to come in are um, going via plain waves for periodic calculations or to do a molecule in a box, which we covered next week. And then the following week, we'll be touching on shooter potentials. And I think that's most of the puzzle at that point. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll just move forward in order to leave some, maybe some room at the end for questions. So example of applications, and this is what you can do uh, with uh, QMC pack and uh, Nexus for the applications. Uh, on molecules, and one of them that I uh, that is very dear to my heart because it's the core of my research nowadays is how to systematically reduce the fixed knob error. So we've seen with the example of the beryllium dimer that we would get very good results, but we're still 19 milli heart rate off uh, with all these DFT calculations. It's better than DFT, but it's not fantastic. DFT gives us 25 milli heart rate. So how can we improve that results? Well, it's very simple. With Diffusion Monte Carlo, everything depends on the quality of the nodes that we get from this anti-symmetric part. If we make it more complicated, then that's it, we fix it. Basically here, instead of using one single determinant, we use a linear combination of multi-determinant. You can see it as when you do a heart refock, you have, if you have four orbitals and two electrons, your heart refock is just, you have, you populate those two electrons on your orbitals and that's one determinant and that's it. The reality we all know from quantum chemistry classes that the reality is a linear combination where you have all the possible permutations of your two electrons over the total number of orbitals present and the total number, and that is gonna give you technically the full, the full configuration interaction space. And basically, you will be able to get the full definition. So you might have that ground state that is described with a very high coefficient that comes here. But you will also have all the other ones that represent a possible probability of existence of your, of your electrons on that determinants. In other words, instead of having just one nodal surface, 
you will have a linear combination of all the possible nodal surfaces. So if you select a move or solution to the Schrodinger equation using the Fusion Monte Carlo um, algorithm, and that crosses a node for one function, it might not cross it for the other determinant. So you will be solving this for each determinant individually, and you're going to start solving it. And now you have linear combination of all the possible nodal surfaces, if you want, that will be able to completely remove or systematically reduce your energy. The more of these determinants you have, the lower your energy is going to be, or at least the closer you're going to be to the exact solution. And this is one way to do things. You can do this either using CASSCF or you can do it with selected configuration and interaction. You have other ways to do this by using orbital optimization. So for example, you can still stay with your anti-symmetric, just one determinant, but you can add your JASTRO function that has the dynamic correlation. And now you're going to start just rotating and just optimizing your orbital coefficients until they minimize the energy because the method is variational. It's a little bit costly, but it's possible to do. And there are publications now that we have on QNC back using this method that works pretty well, even on solids. Um, and maybe uh, uh, Josh will talk about it next week or will show it as part of his developments. OK, and of course, you can use a combination of all the others. You can do optim uh, um, orbital optimizations with multi-determinants and with jazz rows and back rows, and you can just add everything. And because the method is variational, you will never be able to go below. You will just get closer and closer and closer at a certain cost. Uh, this has been tested on the G1 test set, uh, which is a chemistry test set. Here, we start from uh, just normal single determinant DMC. And this coefficients here correspond to this part here. We're going to talk a lot about the coefficients. So this is the linear combination of multi-determinants. The coefficients just say the weight of each determinant. The higher, the more important the weight. And basically here what it says is that we take all the determinants that have a weight of 0.0015. So it goes from the ground state to a certain level. Then we add more determinants by taking ones that have lesser coefficients. And the more we increase or we reduce the size of the coefficient, which means the more determinants we add, you can see that the mean average error just goes very, very nicely. This works also on a variation of Monte Carlo. If you look at this version here of the multi-determinant with uh, a large multi-determinant expansion, it's significantly better than a diffusion Monte Carlo with uh, just one determinant. So it has value. And if you were at the level where your nodal surface is exact, you technically could even reach the point where you don't need this diffusion Monte Carlo. This is a more recent uh, paper from 2016 by collaborators in France, uh, where they have the water molecule. We know the experimental, um, uh, the experimental total energy of water. And you start from a double zeta, triple zeta, quadruple zeta. And basically, this is using selected CI. I'm going to describe it a little bit later. But basically, the full CI space has up to 10 to the power 10 uh, determinants. So that's, that's a lot of determinants. But in QMC, they only used 170,000. And this number is here. And you can see that there is, however, a dependence on the basis at this level in QMC. Because water is really a, a horrible, it seems simple, but it's a horrible system. The red dots here are quantum chemistry method full CI. So this is full configuration interaction. And you see the difference in the basis set, uh, the, the, the basis set dependence. So in both methods, if you want to reach the exact solution, you need to do a basis set extrapolation. But in the, the case of QMC, you can technically do it with just a double, triple, and quadruple. Here, the double zeta is would be at the equivalent of outside of the screen, so it would not be possible to see it. But you see here that both would converge to the same value because it's full CI, so you introduce no, um, no approximation. And QMC is able to get exactly the same result. And you can see also that at quadruple zeta, you're already extremely converged, well converged compared to what you might find in other methods. This method using- Anoa? Yes? Just, just uh, quick, quick comment, just Watch out for the time. Yes, I'm, I'm almost done. These are my last slides. OK, great. So basically, this is selected configuration interaction um, method. It's basically a method which is iterative, where you're going to start from your ground state, and you're going to start adding the single and double excitations. And then you just keep the determinants that are of value. And how do you judge that they are value of not? You basically just pick the ones that contribute to the energy above a certain threshold. Um, 
this is and you repeat the operation and once you do single and doubles and you do again single and doubles on these excitations you end up with the triples and quadruples etc and until you finish the full space we did it here for the beryllium dimer and we just started from the hartrifoc and we started increasing the number of determinants and we actually reach a 0.5 uh, million determinants and we converge at 0.1 milli from the selected C from the full ci energy which is quite remarkable with half a million determinants uh, we get 0.1 milli from the full ci energy that is um, here. So keep in mind that 0.45 million determinants run on my laptop, and that was not very expensive to run with this. This is all part of a code called Quantum Package 2, which is uh, uh, natively uh, linked to QMC Pack. So again, it's important to know, so I provided you with the wave function that comes from this uh, expansion, but it's important to know that quantum package two is not part of the virtual machine. So you cannot really uh, run that part of how to generate the wave function from your uh, virtual machine. However, it's part of the talk that I presented in 2011 on the workshop, and you can see there how to install it, how to run the calculation. In this specific case, I have generated this wave function that you have here. And you just need to actually run it directly. I have provided a fix here. And what you have here, and this is true also for the methods that I described earlier, if you want to use TurboMall or any of the other methods, you just need to specify where the orbitals are in this section of generate convert for QMC. If you remember earlier where we added the cusp, you just specify where the wave function is. And basically you can start the part of the QMC. So we will not see the selected CI, but you will see the, the, the QMC calculation. In this specific case, what I did is just started from Hartree-Fark with a triple zeta basis set, and I generated the multi-determinant wave function up to that 0.5 million. But from that 0.5 million, I just truncated any coefficient that was a uh, smaller contribution. Only I kept only the coefficients that have a larger contribution at 10 to the minus 5, and that's only 395 determinants. So that's not too much. And I run this in... Uh, uh, QMC pack using Nexus, and you have access to those files here. And basically, you can see here that this is the variational energy or the full CI within the space set. We run the single determinant quantum Monte Carlo calculation. This is the calculation that we had earlier. So you see the energy that is here. This is the one that we computed earlier in all electron with this variance or this ratio. Now I run a multi determinant on exactly the same, so in this multi-determinant wave function that we have just generated, you see that the variance has reduced by a factor almost two. So basically the variance is significantly better than the single determinant, and our energy now is really, really lower. So the variational, the VMC energy is better than the DMC from the single determinant, and the DMC energy now is extremely close. We're only 1.5 milliHertz away from the experimental energy. And this is with only 395. Experimental energy should be at the CBS limit where in triple zeta. And you see that we are getting extremely, extremely good with a very, very small variance with this. Other example of applications that use larger type of, and this is publication level. So you have this paper from that I mentioned earlier from Matthew Zubecki and Ubosh Mitas on um, using quantum Monte Carlo to describe non covalent interactions. And basically in this paper here, they have all this bunch of molecules here in interactions between benzene, water, benzene, methane, etc. And they get 2.1 kilocal per mole from couple cluster. Remember, couple cluster scales n to the seventh or n to the fifth. In some cases, there are some approximations for local approximations where you can scale uh, better than this. But QMC scales n to the second with the number of electrons. So this is quite remarkable that we can use this thing. And this is something that we have shown in the L7 benchmark. This is a paper that we have published last year, uh, where these now are the size of the molecule that we have done with these interactions. And a couple of cluster cannot do them unless they really have a lot of extrapolations and corrections to the basis set. And you can see here that in Couple cluster results are all over the place because they need to have a lot of approximations to be able to extrapolate to the CPS limit. And the difference with the QMC in the best studies are always within the kilocal per mole or lower than the kilocal per mole in all cases. 
And in this case, DMC becomes the reference for the couple cluster in specific cases. Uh, one nice thing about this is that we happen to do these calculations in parallel with our colleagues in Europe using the casino code. And for and we run exactly the same test set. And we basically find that our energies are exactly the same. They used uh, ECPs, pseudo potentials. We used all electrons. They use different type of basis sets. We use different type of basis sets. Uh, and yet we reach exact exactly the same results. All these results are uh, the same. So it's a good confirmation that QMC is a pretty nice method and you can start the dependence in this class of materials to the uh, starting point is very, very minimal. Um, you can do anything that you want with the method. There is no real uh, limit, except of course for the high Z, the moment you start touching things that need spin orbit coupling. So you need to be a little bit more careful, but we have now spin orbit coupling that is fully implemented and there will be a talk about it during this series of talks. Um, you can see that calculations using, for example, dissociation energies of C2 have been done almost like 20 years ago, oh God, 20 years ago already, um, 15 years ago at least. So the method is well, well implemented. Uh, we know, or at least we hope we know what we are doing. You can do on a workstation anywhere between 10 to 20 electron calculations. So that's a lot of dissociation curves that you can think of that you can do. On larger clusters, these don't have to be massive. This just need to be the size of your university class clusters. You can do class calculations like Van der Waals systems, the A24 benchmark, which nobody did, binding energies going from the below kilocal per mole to 10 kilocal per mole. I would say within the five to 10 kilocal per mole, it's the safe area. If you want to go below that, then maybe it's a little bit harder and it's slightly more complicated, but all this class of small peptides um, type of systems can be studied with QMC and with the Nexus framework that we have just uh, showed. So in summary, I hope that uh, I covered how to run VMC and DMC from the beginning till the end using Gaussian basis sets, how to choose and converge your time step and other parameters uh, of QMC. And also that DMC is a really, really powerful tool to study consistently molecular systems and to compare to couple cluster even when uh, possible, when available, when the data is available. We have no dependence on the basis set, or at least very minimal uh, compared to other uh, methods. Uh, and uh, it is possible to systematically improve your trial wave function and even to extrapolate to zero, zero error in your wave function if you have a more complicated wave function. Um, uh, sorry, if you have a more complicated trial wave function. Uh, all this can be done with Nexus with a minimum amount of effort on yourself and just create workflows that are almost the same and you just change input files with uh, the, the name of the, the molecules and things like that. So Nexus is a really powerful tool to be able to automate a lot of these things. And I invite you to take to be here next week for week five uh, on QMC for solids. And it's gonna be uh, done by Dr. Josh Donstead from CMD and National Lab. At this point, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks very much, Anwar. While we're giving time for people to type, as I, I don't see any unanswered questions right now, um, I'll just echo here something I put in the chat about QP2. Uh, if people get to that, this point and are, and are interested, we can certainly put QP2 in an updated version of the workshop image as we've had it installed before. We just didn't have a, a chance to do it uh, time-wise and test it before this workshop. So do ask on the in the Slack if you get to that point. And again, for the multi-determinant trial wave function, so the output from QP has been provided. So you should not need to run QP if you want to test again with that, um, with that wave function. We did not show it in this specifically in this tutorial because otherwise it would have needed to be a full six hour class but you can even reduce furthermore the size of the trial wave function through Nexus by just changing the size of the coefficients. And you can play with that by putting, for example, you have 395, you can put 1, 10, 20, 30, 40, 95, and you would see a nice uh, decay of the energy as you go. But this, again, you can follow the tutorial from 2019 and it has tricks and it would show how to do that. So I don't see any questions yet, but I have one. And 
you know, there's lots of possible choices uh, here. And, you know, echoing some of the answers from previous comments, you know, we pointed out that, you know, these are all testable and they're sort of defined by the physics and chemistry of the systems. But where in the, in the literature might be a good place for people to look if they're wondering about some of these choices of, you know, how complex a wave function they might need. For example, some of these recent applications you had at the end, would they be a good place to, to look for sort of recipes? Yes. So um, for there are different things for the choice of the wave function and the dependence of the wave function, for example, on the basis set, I would recommend papers from either Mathieu Stubecki, Lubosz Mitas, or Ken Jordan, who have done a lot of work on basically stripping down the basis sets to their bare minimum. Um, unfortunately, there were no systematic studies that will show um, exactly um, what needs to be chosen because the chemistry is still driven a lot by the chemistry of the, the, the problem. However, in this paper here, they even tried to plot or they project a multidimensional trial uh, nodal surface um, on a 2D plot to try to see a little bit how that is affected by the wave function and how that is affected with the basis sets. But this paper here, I still consider it as a good introduction of what should be taken in terms of guiding function, because here they really uh, show why an augmented triple is significantly better. Rule of thumb is uh, the paper also from the Berylium Nimer uh, it shows a very nice discussion about the use of G orbitals and F orbitals for QNC. And basically this is what um, Ken Jordan considers that it's completely useless to use higher order and going to diffuse is significantly better than going to, to a large basis set. So there are a few, there's not too many papers pointing at how things should be done in quantum chemistry, but uh, these authors are pretty good at describing um, why they picked what they chose. So I would recommend reading this one and the Berlium one are good introductions on, on the subject.